Well, it's an honor to have uh, Peter Stone uh, with us today for an MSRAI Distinguished Lecture. Peter is a Centennial Professor and Associate Chair of Computer Science, as well as Chair of the Robotics Program at the University of Texas at Austin. He did his PhD work uh, at Carnegie Mellon, um, and he did his bachelor's work at the University, University of Chicago uh, in mathematics. I should say that the his CMU work was in computer science. Um, and after that, he went off to be uh, a member of technical staff at at t Labs for, uh, I think, two or three years. Looks like three. Uh, and um, uh, before coming to UT Austin. Um, his research interests include planning, machine learning, multi-agent systems, robotics, and e-commerce. And he's uh, uh, applied um, various principles uh, of the aforementioned uh, areas to robot soccer, uh, autonomous bidding agents, and uh, autonomous traffic management. Peter has developed teams of robot soccer agents that have won 11 uh, robo soccer tournaments in both simulation and in the real world version of that contest. And he's also been working on agents that have uh, placed in, in winning roles in, in 10 auction trading agent competitions, the TAC uh, competition. Peter is a Sloan Fellow, Guggenheim Fellow, AAAI Fellow, IEEE Fellow, AAAS Fellow, <coughs> and a Fulbright Scholar. And I, I've um, put some pen through the list so it's shorter, you know, but there's more, there's more there. Uh, and in, in 2013, he was awarded the, the UT Austin, or University of Texas System Regents Outstanding Teaching Award and inducted into the UT Austin Academy of Distinguished Teachers. And we'll be benefiting maybe a little bit of that today in, in his lecture. Uh, he also received the Ichkai, uh, the, the, the uh, prestigious Ichkai Computers and Thought Award, uh, which goes to a leading AI researcher under 35, just a, just a, a couple, a few years ago, uh, and um, uh, the Autonomous Agents Research Award, um, uh, a little bit before that. He's also uh, renowned in being the the uh, chair of the Standing Committee of the 100-Year Study on AI, and uh, that's a quite a distinguished role as well. So with that, Peter. All right. Thanks, Eric, for the, for the very uh, kind introduction. And, and yeah, it's been a, been a real uh, pleasure and honor working, working with, uh, with Eric on the 100-year on the study of artificial intelligence. And we, um, we're at an interesting moment now where we're, we're trying to, uh, to uh, think about what the second, um, the second study will look like. We got, got a lot, great reception from the, from the first one. And as, as Eric likes to say, you know, um, this is a, it's a longitudinal study. The one, one point doesn't make a line, but two points do make a line. And so there's a lot of pressure on what the second one will look like to, uh, to really sort of get, the, get this going. So um, spending a lot of time thinking about that. So, but yeah, thanks, for, thanks for, the, uh, for inviting me to be here. It's a real honor. And thanks, all of you, for, for coming. Um, in a talk like this, I often have to, to make a choice. Is, is, you know, I, there's a bunch of different things that I do in my lab. And um, so you know, I could give to sort of uh, pick a single topic and go deeply and talk just about that. Or I could give sort of a, you know, a broad and, and uh, shallow uh, overview of lots of different things. I'm going to try to sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, skirt the, the difference between those two and, and give you an overview of, of what I focus on in my lab in general, but then also take a couple of, of deep dives on, a, on, a, on two um, technical uh, contributions that we've made recently, some of which were um, uh, led by people who are sitting, sitting in this room, happen to be here at, at Microsoft now. Um, and those are going to focus on efficient robot uh, skill learning. So first of the, you know, sort of the overview, um, I've been, been uh, the talks that I've given almost for the, I realized recently, I can say, for the last quarter century have um, almost, or many of them have had this, this research question. It's sort of the theme that's driven my research over, um, over that long period of time, and it's to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and or adversaries in real-time dynamic domains? 
And that's sort of what unifies all the different things um, we do in my lab that uh, leads us to publish in, in various different areas, the autonomous agents and multi-agent systems conferences, um, robotics as well. Some autonomous agents are robots, though not all are. Um, and then within machine learning, especially to focus on, on reinforcement learning. And I'm going to um, really look at, at the, uh, the interplay between reinforcement learning and, and robotics in this talk. Um, we do, in, in my lab, sort of work from both ends of the, of the problem. We you know, uh, there's work that sort of uh, starts from the algorithms and the theory and sort of you know, what I call sort of bottom-up uh, research towards applications. And we also work sort of from the other end, from some motivating applications and, um, and you know, more top-down, try to, to think about what, what kind of uh, research um, uh, needs are there that we don't yet have within our, within our arsenal, within, within AI, and, um, and to use that as sort of a, a pulling function. And if I'm going to give a one-slide overview, it's, it's hard to give the details of the, you know, the algorithms and theory, but I can very quickly give you an overview of some of the motivating application domains that I've worked on over the years. And, uh, and those include, as uh, Eric said in the introduction, um, robot soccer. This is uh, a clip from a competition about um, uh, almost 15 years ago now where our, uh, these robots made by Sony, the Sony IBOs, were, uh, were working autonomously, try, uh, trying to score a goal. Um, when Sony stopped making those, uh, those robots, the, the standard platform league moved to these uh, humanoid robots, the Nows that are now made by SoftBank. Our, our robots are the ones that they're, uh, with their hands behind their back. Um, and this was the finals of the 2012 competition in Mexico City. We were playing against a team from the University of Bremen, who was the, the, um, the prior year champion. And uh, you have to remember when this, you're looking at this, the robots are fully autonomous. They're um, sense, just sensing, deciding, and acting. Here's our robot going in on a breakaway. Um, a little bit slowly, but, um, but it, uh, this was the, um, you'll see it uh, go up and, and calmly bank the ball off of the, off of the goal post and into the, into the goal. So that was on, a, uh, that was on our way to a, um, to a 4-2 victory, and when we got back to, to Austin, they lit the tower orange for us, which they usually only do when the football team wins, so we were very, <laughs> um, very honored by that. I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a lot more about, about RoboCup on the, on the next slide. I just became the president of the, the um, Robot Soccer Federation, I'll talk a, so I'll talk a little bit, bit about that. But we also work in um, uh, social robotics, in robots, oh, service robots. This is a video from a, a joint work with my colleague Ray Mooney um, on grounded language learning for robots. So this is a, um, a video that was illustrating a, a study that we did where we have these ro the robots like this sort of wandering our hall more often than not. We, I tell people you don't have to ask us for a demo. You just come to, to our wing and there'll be this robot wandering around. In this particular case, it was um, over a week-long study learning the way people would ask for, uh, for leading and delivery tasks. And we were able to show that over the over the course of the week that that it was that it got uh, the dialogues got shorter. People were reporting that uh, they were less frustrated with the interactions, um, and uh, and it was more successful at, at completing the tasks that um, that people um, that people wanted to do. I also had a I did have a car in the DARPA Urban Challenge back in 2007. So this is our car in the um, in the in the back that's waiting to, to make a left hand turn. Um, all the other cars working on the in inside were driven by human drivers with, uh, with helmets on, looking a little bit scared, but we didn't run into them. So um, our car made, uh, it had to you know, find a gap in traffic, make a left turn. It did that uh, about eight loops in 20 minutes. We don't have that autonomous car anymore. We, um, we retired, uh, retired it. All the car companies are really you know, investing a lot of money in, in um, autonomous cars now. But we do still think about what the world will look like when all the cars on the road are autonomous. Will we still need traffic signals and stop signs? Um, or can we, uh, we using multi-agent systems, have something that looks more like this? What's going on here is the cars that are uh, white. This is a simulation, of course. The cars that are white um, have uh, called ahead for a reservation. Instead of uh, you know, dealing with red lights and green lights there, they have a reservation for the space time that they'll go through the intersection. The ones that are yellow don't have a reservation yet, but once they turn white, they have a guaranteed path through the intersection that won't, um, that won't collide with any of the other cars. One of the, uh, one of the first times I showed this was, um, was uh, about 12 or 13 years ago at a talk I was giving in India, and somebody said, oh, all the intersections look like this. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but the difference here is that, that we, can, we can guarantee that, uh, that as long as the cars are following the protocol, there won't be, won't be any accidents. So 
Um, and this has led to, you know, again, a decade and a half or so of research on how can we make uh, traffic flow through intersections and city grids more efficient without necessarily um, building, building more roads. And that, that also could be the subject of a, of a full talk. And so these are the kinds of applications that motivate the research that I do in my lab that I'm going to um, talk about uh, in the sort of technical deep dives. Um, but also, I should say that, that I have a, um, you know, sort of, we got to the point where we feel like reinforcement learning is ready for, for prime time, for, for industrial usage. Um, and so I formed a, a, a company called Kojitai. Um, I'm the uh, president and COO. Oops, I think I might be at, yeah, at the end of it, not at the beginning. Um, uh, founded the company with, with Satinder Singh and, and Mark Ring. Um, and there's uh, an illustrious um, brain trust, we call it, uh, that have sort of been uh, colleagues working on reinforcement learning with us over the, um, over the years. And just a, a few months ago, we launched um, a Continua, a, a SaaS platform that's designed for, uh, not for people who, uh, who want to do research on reinforcement learning, so maybe probably not the target audience of people in this room so much, as much as people who want to use reinforcement learning in an industrial setting. Um, and, uh, and so maybe, you know, maybe some of you don't want to necessarily get into reinforcement learning research, but have a problem where reinforcement learning would apply. Um, this is now uh, available for, for, um, for use. You can get a 40-day free trial. You can, you know, and then we've got some of the first markets here in, in uh, automotive and robotics control and semiconductor control. But really, we feel like the, the use cases for reinforcement learning are endless. Um, but most of the platforms that are out there are sort of designed for researchers. And this is, you know, so we've, we've put all of our effort into sort of making this um, scalable and easy to use for, um, for people who want to, uh, to, to apply reinforcement learning. And, um, and the long-term objective, you know, there's lots of platforms for supervised learning. We see reinforcement learning as sort of the stepping stone towards, uh, towards the, the ultimate objective of, of continual learning, being able to um, to learn multiple different tasks from one another in a sort of transfer learning kinds of setting in one sort of long, ongoing um, existence, just like we do as, as people. Um, so I'll be happy to, I'm not going to talk so much about Kojitai in this talk, but I'll be happy, more than happy, to, to, uh, to talk with anybody offline um, if you're interested. And of course, you, know, you can get information on our, on our website. So you know, that's sort of the, uh, the overview of the kinds of things we, we, uh, I work on and some of the motivation. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend just one more, uh, I'm going to go a little bit more detail into RoboCup, the Robot Soccer World Cup, because that's really the, um, the motivation for the, um, for the efficient robot skill learning that I'm going to talk about. And then I'm going to do, like I say, sort of two um, more deep dives on, on te technical aspects. One uh, in the space of, of sim to real, so learning and simulation, getting that to apply on a real robot. We introduced a new algorithm known as, as grounded simulation learning. And then I'm also going to talk about imitation learning from, um, from observation, and in particular, two different algorithms that we've uh, introduced recently, one based on behavioral cloning and one based on inverse reinforcement learning. So to start with the motivation, I said, you know, I've shown you some clips from, from RoboCup. Um, I am about to be, or I am now the president of the, the RoboCup Federation, which includes people from around the world who all are, are bound by a, an ambitious long-term goal, which is to create a team of humanoid, humanoid robots that can beat the World Cup champions on a real soccer field by the year 2050. It's good to have goals. We know long, you know, the, who knows? People ask me if it'll be possible or not. Uh, you know, 30 years is a long time. We learned a long time ago in AI that if you're going to make a, you know, in a prediction like this, best to put a year on it that's after you're likely to have retired, because then you know, you, no one will hold you to it. Um, but um, but it's, you know, it's, it's been going on now for, for many years. We just had um, the uh, 23rd RoboCup, I believe. And um, there's several different leagues. It's got many virtues as a, as a challenge problem. Um, very different from sort of, you know, having the physical interaction makes it very different from some of the games like chess and go and Jeopardy and, and things like that. Um, there's, uh, there are different leagues, but the best way to see some of the progress is to see what it looked like starting back in, in the early years. The first RoboCups were in 1997 and 1998. These are uh, different leagues. Up in the top left, the standard platform league, those were the early Sony Ibo robots. Um, and, uh, and these are videos from teams that were created by people you know, from, from around the world, not all my own robots. The middle-sized robots up here um, were using a real soccer ball. And you know, there were some, some goals scored, even though there wasn't much resistance from goaltenders all, uh, all that often. Um, 
uh, this, the beginning of the simulation league, the small size league. The, back in the 90s, I mean, these are just sort of frustrating to watch right now and you know, when, I, when I look at it. But you have to remember, back in 1997, a lot of roboticists you know, didn't really have robots, right? They worked on an aspect of the problem, said this could apply to robots. Getting you know, 30 robots in a room that um, only caught on fire occasionally was a big, uh, was a big win back in, in that time. If you now jump ahead 10 years, but still you know, quite some time in the past, um, 2005, 2006, you can see a, a lot of improvements. There's, you know, the robots are moving more quickly. They're better individually. They're, um, they're starting to be teamwork. It was the, uh, the beginning of the, um, the humanoid league, so they just did a penalty shot competition that year. Um, but uh, now there's, there's games with these humanoid robots, and you know, there were uh, attempted saves. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, and the, you know, again, the thing to remember here is that all, all of these are, are, fully, um, are fully autonomous. One of the leagues uh, that we've been most successful in is the, is the 3D Simulation League. And in fact, Patrick McAlpine, who's now, uh, now here in the audience, has been really the driving force behind that. I think we just won for the uh, eighth time in nine years. This is a, um, uh, some highlights from a couple of years ago. Um, but this gives you a sense of what the 3D Simulation League looks like. Each of, the, uh, each of the agents is controlled by a separate process. So unlike a video game where you could have one program controlling all of them, um, they have partial information. Um, and we've used a, uh, a several different techniques, but, but uh, uh, our, you know, this, um, this is Patrick's uh, favorite highlight, so I always promise him I'll show, show this one. Um, it wasn't on purpose, but uh, you know, the, the robot managed to kick it through the legs of the opponent and, uh, and into the goal. Um, but the, we, we've used a hierarchical machine learning method here to, to learn skills that have been uh, turned out to be uh, more robust than the other teams at, at walking and kicking and things like that, and also some multi-agent methods to figure out where the, the robots should, um, should position themselves. So this will come back um, into, uh, into the next segment of the talk as well. Um, but again, you know, the, the challenges there are, are immense. And, it, and you know, just getting the robots, it's in a physics simulator, so just getting them to be able to stand up without falling over is itself a challenge. Um, and again, we could give, I could give a whole talk on, on the, uh, the research that's gone into that um, and that, that was really uh, the, the centerpiece of, of Patrick's dissertation. Um, I did say the goal is by the year 2050 to have a team of humanoid robots that can beat the best World Cup champions on the real soccer field. We don't play against uh, the World Cup champions, but the, the champions of the middle size league here um, often uh, play against uh, myself and some colleagues. So this is from uh, 2011, where, and the, the people who make the robots always say, oh, they're going to hurt you. It's gonna, you know, they're way too fast for you. But then we show that the um, aging, uh, aging amateur soccer players are still able to to pass the ball around the robots. That goal didn't count because I was called for offsides. But in the, you know, in principle, you can see that we're still faster than the, um, faster than the, the robots, able, you know, better, better low-level skills. But every year, it does get a little bit harder. Um, some people you know, say this because we're getting older, not because the robots are getting better. But I actually think it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, so, uh, and, and we just did that again. And actually, when I look at this now, we just, you know, we just had the 2019 competition. And uh, definitely, the robots are a lot faster and more capable uh, now than they were you know, even, even just a few years ago in that video. Um, I should also, I want to emphasize that RoboCup is not just about soccer. It's also, uh, there's, there's RoboCup Rescue for disaster rescue scenarios. And there's also, we participate in my lab in RoboCup at Home, which is similarly for robotics, multi-agent systems, AI, but now in a service robot ca capacity. And there's, um, there's a few different leagues there, including a standard platform league where everybody uses this Toyota HSR robot. Um, and the robot has to do tasks like putting away groceries on shelves um, and, like, and, uh, and interacting with people, setting the table. This, this is a clip from a taking out the trash. Um, the robot has to go to a trash can, uh, take off the lid, pick up the, um, pick up the, the garbage. Um, it's, it's over a five-minute trial. It has to actually pick up two different garbage uh, bags, to take them to a, um, uh, a deposit location. So I'm not going to show the show the whole video, but these are the kinds of, of tasks that we have the, um, have the robot doing. So this is where it gets to you know, the second bag and then um, navigates to the, to the end there. But it's, there's you know, a lot of human-robot interaction kinds of um, challenges that come up in this, uh, in this event. Um, 
And uh, motiv the, including um, one of the tasks is, is a, a restaurant task where the robot's taken to um, a restaurant that it's never been in before, so it hasn't mapped, where there's real customers, is then um, people have to tell it orders, and it has to go up to a table, identify what was ordered, pick them up, bring them to the person. Um, these are the kinds of challenges that, and it's, this is very, very difficult. It motivates the kind of, of um, reasoning that we just um, presented at a... Uh, at the ICAPS conference, my uh, PhD student, Yu Chen Zhang, um, uh, is shown here interacting with the robot in an open, uh, open world reasoning kind of scenario. So, um, where the. Uh, um, she's talking with the robot about trying to bring fruit from the, from the kitchen. All right, I'll get on that. Turn it up a little bit. Okay. Now the point of this video is that the um, she, she said that she wants an apple, but the, the robot doesn't know uh, for sure. This is open world reasoning, so it doesn't know for sure if there is an apple in the kitchen. And so we're going to have sort of two different endings to this to this video. One in which it searches for the um, for the apple. I'll speed it up a little bit. Um, searches for the apple on a, in a, the the locations in the kitchen where the the apple may be. Um, and uh, doesn't find an apple there, so it th then goes to the next place. Here, it, in this version of the video, it finds the apple, um, and uh, and now it basically has to do a, a step of sort of um, merging the, the the hypothetical apple that it you know that it had uh, had in its knowledge base with the actual instance of the apple, and then taking it back to um, to Yu Chen, and um, see we can, we still have some. There's uh, plenty of work that could be done on the, the human robot interface, as you'll see here. Hi. <laughs> Please be ready to accept the But in the alternate uh, version of the world here, where the, there wasn't, it isn't an apple, um, it then goes and looks again for, for other places where it might be. Um, but then it, uh, you know, it's, it keeps the, the apple in its knowledge base as being hypothetical. And when it doesn't find one, it has to, to go back and, and report that to the person. And uh, even, this is even a little more awkward, but you'll hear what the, uh, what the robot says. I could not complete the task due to inconsistent <laughs> hypotheses from your request. I assumed a hypothetical apple at the kitchen, but that turned out to be false. So we'll, we'll work on the actual language. But the, the point here was the, was the reasoning and the ability to, you know, for the robot to be able to, uh, to deal with, with you know, multiple different actual you know, worlds and, and keep um, it, the key to this was keeping some objects as being hypothetical as opposed to being instantiated fully in the, in the knowledge base. OK. so. That's, those are the kinds of things that, that motivate um, a lot of the work that we do in my lab. Um, the robot soccer challenge, the RoboCup at home challenge, one of the things you have to do if you're, if you're going to be able to succeed at these is to have um, low-level skills for these robots. And so here's where I'm going to go into a little bit more technical detail on how we've achieved that. First, in um, a sim to real context, and this is um, joint work with both Patrick, who's, who's here, and Josiah Hanna, a PhD student of mine who's about to graduate and is going to start a faculty position at uh, University of Wisconsin. Um, and the, uh, the idea, is, the motivation here is that learning on, on physical robots is not very data efficient. It requires supervision, especially if you're trying to get them to walk. They can fall over. They could break. Um, and, uh, and so it's, you know, it's very tempting to say, well, let's build a good simulator and just learn in simulation and make that work on the, uh, on the real robots. But you know, you learn very quickly if you've if you've done this. People have tried this for years. That you know, you can you can learn in simulation a very robust walk like this one. This is some, one of our learning trials from early years where we were having the robot try to uh, to learn as well as possible to to kick to to walk uh, fast while dribbling a soccer ball. If we take that walk skill and put it into the real world, um, it uh, it can execute. So you can actually take those same commands and execute them on the robot, but after two steps, it, it falls over, right? It's not a good policy. It's, it's an executable policy, but not a good policy. You can see sort of in, in slow motion here. It, you know, it takes a couple steps, and then it looks like it's tripping over the line, but the line's actually flat. So, um, so uh, 
you know, so the question here is how, how can we, uh, and there's been a bunch of research on this problem of, of sim to real. So we're not the first, of course, to, to think about how can we bring these, to, to bridge this reality gap, the gap between simulation and reality. There's, there's two sort of classes of approach. One is to, to try to learn a robust policy, to make your simulator more noisy, right? To make it as, as um, so, that, so that whatever policy you learn is likely to, uh, to work even in, in environments that are not the same as the simulator. And so there's sort of a, a class of, of approaches that, that try to do that. Um, and, uh, and then there's another class that, that tries to, um, to make the simulator more like the real world based on data from the real world and try to, you know, to, to get the simulator to really al align with the real world. And, and the approach I'm going to talk about falls within that second class. But with the crucial um, difference is that most people are doing that trying to make a perfect simulator. And we start this research with the, with the idea and the acceptance that that's never going to happen. There's always going to be a reality gap. Instead, we're just going to try to make the, the simulator closer to the real world in a partic the particular pace, place in policy space where we're currently searching. And so um, the, the basic uh, paradigm is going to be uh, an iterative process where we take a real world policy execution. Um, and then some uh, state action trajectories, use that to ground the simulator. And I'll tell you exactly how we do that in a second. Take that grounded simulator and then do policy improvement in simulation and then repeat. That gives us an improved policy that we can then execute in the real world. We can then reground the simulator and, um, and, and keep going. So the crucial you know, uh, question here is how do we ground the, uh, the simulator? And oh, I should have said uh, two slides back. I should have mentioned that you know, it, um, on, in, uh, in general, you can, uh, you know, it's not that hard to build a simulator that, that has the same format of policy. It takes the same actions out. It has the same sort of states and, and rewards. Um, the thing that's very difficult is, is to make it so that the transitions, that the state, and, you know, the state transitions and the reward function for the action that you give are the same. They're typically very different. That's what makes the simulator different from, um, from reality. So the... Um, so in some sense, what we want to do is to, to alter the simulated environment so that it's, that it's closer to the real world. And in fact, we're going to do that by, uh, in a black box kind of a way, one way with, without opening the simulator at all, by just placing a wrapper around the actions that get sent from the, um, from the policy to the simulated environment with the goal that if an action was uh, sent, we want to change it to an action such that it has the same effect in the state and reward space um, in the simulated environment as the original action would have had in the real environment. Okay, so that's the, that's the grounding, and I'm going to tell you exactly how we do that. We're going to, so we, we replace an action, every action that comes out of the policy, with an action that, that produces a more realistic um, transition. So we're, in effect, learning this function g shown here. And actually, I'm going to tear that, or, uh, open that up into two separate functions. One's a forward model of the simulator that says, Given the state I'm in and the action that I just took, what's the next state that I'm going to get to? So that's a, that's a forwards dynamics model of the real world. And then there's an inverse dynamics model of the simulator that says, if I'm in a particular state, st, and I want to get to the next state, s hat, what's the action I would need to take to, to cause that transition? That's an inverse dynamics model of the, um, of the simulator. So you can think of that uh, just in one dimension. If we take this, you know, my elbow as the joint that's being controlled, it might be that in the real world, if I tell it to move to 90 degrees in one time step, it doesn't get there, right? It only gets maybe uh, you know, a, a third of the way. But in the simulator, it goes maybe two thirds of the way, let's say, because the simulator has a, you know, um, doesn't have the, as, as slow a reaction time. Well, then the forwards dynamics model will say that from 180 degrees, if I tell it to go to 90 degrees, it will actually you know, move to, um, you know, uh, I guess, what would it be? One, 100, uh, 145 degrees or something like that. Um, and, then, uh, and then we say, well, what's the command that I would have to give in the simulator from 180 degrees to get to 145 degrees? That's the inverse dynamics model. So that's in one joint. Now we want to do this for the, the whole. Um, for all of the, the joints in the robot. And, so, and then once you do that, we have basically a, a grounding, an action transformation that works at this, the current point in policy space that we're operating. Why the current point, point in policy, policy space? Because this forwards dynamics model is based on real world trajectories from the current policy that we're executing. Um, and so we, we learn both the 
forwards model and the inverse dynamics model but from a relatively small number of real world trajectories. So um, 2,000 time steps uh, each and 15 of these gives us a whole bunch of transitions of here's the state I was in with all my joints, here's the action that I was given, um, and here's what actually happened to the joints. And then similarly in the, in, the, in the simulator, we can get an inverse model saying here's a state I was in, here's the next state I was in, and here's the action that got me there. Um, we learn it with a, with a multi-layered uh, neural network that takes um, you know, state in action from the real world in, gets a predicted next state, which we can get labels from these trajectories, and then takes this state and predicted next state and tries to get the action that would cause that to happen. And, um, and uh, then we can, uh, so that's the basic method. We can then evaluate it in, um, in a number of different ways. We have our real robot, and then we have two different simulators. So, yeah. No, that's right. So I, I'm going to show you that. So we started, so our initial policy here, it was the state of the art, fastest walk that anybody had been able to get to work on this robot. And um, it was developed by some folks at the University of New South Wales. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to show that we, that we improve from there. So yeah, it's not a learning to walk from scratch, from flailing. It's starting from a walk, and can we improve it? That's, a good, that's an important point. So we had two different simulators, sort of a lower fidelity simulator, a more physically real realistic simulator, and then the real robot. So we can do you know, sort of three different uh, kinds of experiments. Um, the main one is going from this simulator to the real world. But then you know, in controlled experiments, we can go from simulator to high, high fidelity simulator to get more, more data. Um, and, uh, and, and so that we do in the paper. The policy search algorithm that we use is, a, is the CMAES. So that's the, the learning algorithm that's, that's being used in simulation. It's a, uh, derivative free stochastic search method. And, um, and then, yeah, to answer the question, here's the initial policy. So this is, um, this is the robot, the, the walk developed by the University of New South Wales. It was the fastest walk at the time. Um, and uh, it uh, was able to go about 19.3 centimeters per second. And, um, and then if we went, uh, we grounded the simulator based on the, the data we took from that, uh, from that walk and then did learning. And, um, and ended up with a walk after one iteration that was um, significantly faster. This is 26.3 centimeters per second. You see it's sort of learning to be a little bit more squat to the ground. Then we repeated and um, regrounded the simulator with data from that walk and ended up with what is, uh, I believe, still the fastest uh, stable walk on these, uh, on these robots at 28 centimeters per second. Um, so that's, uh, and you know, this was done on this, this, single, uh, this single task. Josiah's PhD thesis sort of uses this as the central um, motivator um, and uh, is now getting, trying, to, trying it on, uh, we have had some su success on, one, on another task on the same robot. We're now trying on a completely different uh, sim to real task, uh, a process control task that, that, um, for, uh, in oil refineries. Um, and... Uh, and it also um, opens up some, some interesting theoretical questions, um, empirical questions. When does this kind of approach work and when does it not? But there's also some really interesting connections to off-policy evaluation and reinforcement learning and safe learning. And these are the main sort of theoretical contributions of, of Josiah's dissertation, which he's going to be defending in about um, two or three weeks. So that's a sort of, you know, the, um, yeah, please. I understood the policy distillation and using data to improve the simulators. Has anyone looked at not changing the actions, but the rewards? Because it looks like these rewards are fairly designer-specified. And could there be other ways to come up with the rewards that make the simulated behavior more aligned with? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a good question as well. I mean, there's a lot of research on changing the reward function, shaping rewards, and there's you know, sort of theory about how can you change the reward function such that you won't change the optimal policy. Um, so I'd say that that's, you know, sort of, that's related to this. In, this. in this work, we're focusing on the, the transition function. The reward function is usually easier to, um, to align between simulation and reality, right? I mean, in both cases, it's the speed of the robot that's measurable. There's not really a difference there. The thing that's really hard to... to ground and align between them is 
you know, what will happen when the, you, you, know, execute, you, know, you issue a torque command and the foot is hit, hitting the ground and there's friction. And that transition function is the thing that, um, that people put a lot of effort into trying to get right. And that we basically say, look, we're never going to get that right. There's always going to be a gap. Let's just try to, you know, to, to and, and it's important to note that this grounding function might make the simulation incorrect, more incorrect in other parts of the search space. It just, we just want it to be sort of in the, the region where we're searching. We want to make sure that it's, that it's better. But yeah, it's a good question. Dave? Um, do you think a similar approach would work for perception problems as well, like sensorial, like LIDAR, radar? Um, you know, we, we always like, you know, simulating like, you know, second order effects of radar super hard, um, especially even with, with like good physics models, right? Yeah, in principle, I mean, if you have a simulator that, and you can measure the, the differences between what's happening in the real world and happening in the simulator, then this general idea you could, you could lift up and, and apply. You could say, you know, what happened in the real world? What would I need to do in the simulator to make it more like the real world effect in the perception? And then let's use our learning algorithm in the simulator in that sort of grounded, wrapped simulator. So, yeah, and, and we haven't tried anything like that, but, but in principle, that, yeah, I'd be really interested in seeing if there's, especially if there's a use case for that or like a situation where that's, that's particularly uh, needed and the difficulty is at that, um, at that perceptual modeling, then it would be, yeah, I'd be really, really interested to talk about that. Yeah. What's currently known about the, the second bullet point there? Like, when does it work versus when does it not work? Like, I mean, are there properties about learnability of the forward model and the inverse model that make this appealing? Or is it just fundamentally impossible to distill the effects of the policy versus the inverse model? Yeah, it's a great question. We're really re just at the beginning points of answering that question. We have, we have now two examples of this. You know, this is our best example, the one that you know, we got working first. We have another example of a sort of a, a motion task on this same robot. We're, like I say, we're trying it in, in this third task. And now we're, we're starting to ask questions of like, you know, what properties of the simulation need to be uh, you know, need to hold for it to to um, to be applicable and to work, but but really, uh, we're not far enough along to be able to to for me to give you any any real insight into that yet. I think it's you know it's really early stages for for exploring the you know what are the what are the limitations of this, but we have a really nice success story to to launch from. Good. Let me move on to the second now to the second sort of technical. Uh, Dive deep dive a little bit, and it, it actually has two parts. And it, this is uh, this is the PhD thesis work of, of Faraz Tarabi, who's sitting here as well, um, and uh, doing an internship here this summer. And it's uh, in the area of imitation learning from observation. I'm going to introduce a model-based approach that we call behavioral cloning from observation, and a model-free approach, which is generative adversarial inverse um, imitation from observation. And, uh, and this is joint work with Faraz and also Garrett Warnell, who's a research scientist at Army Research Lab. So, um, so imitation learning in general, the goal is to, to learn how to make decisions by trying to imitate another agent. It's a, another, a very appealing way to try to learn skills on a robot, especially if you have um, examples of what you want them to do. So conventional imitation learning involves having observations of other agents, um, demonstrations, consisting of, of state action pairs. So for instance, uh, this is the work of Scott Necom, where he has a person sort of guiding the robot, saying, here's what I want you to do. And so the robot's, and while he's doing that, the, ro the robot is recording the state that its joints was in and what actions that were taken. What, you know, where did it move next? Um, but the, the challenge with this is that it precludes using a large amount of demonstration data where the action sequences aren't given, like YouTube videos. right? You, there you, you see what happens, but you don't know what actions were taken. And, um, and so there's, you know, there are a bunch of, um, for conventional imitation learning, there, there's two ge general classes of, of algorithms. There's behavioral cloning, um, which is basically you, you take the uh, sequences of, of these demonstrations and try to learn a function directly from when I was in this state, what action was taken. That's a supervised learning problem. For every state that you were in, what action was taken. If you can learn that, then you can try to, to imitate that. And the other class of, of problems is, it is known as inverse reinforcement learning, where you take the demonstrations, try to reverse engineer what's the reward function that the demonstrations are trying to maximize, and then use reinforcement learning to try to maximize that same reward function. And there have been successes in both of these pro approaches, assuming that you have access to the actions, not just the state sequences, but the actions as well. And, um, but in biology, it is possible definitely to learn without access to those um, sequences, as is, is very apparent from this video, um, which uh, um, 
I've, you know, I've always assumed when I watch this video that it's uh, that the um, the bird is imitating the people just by observation. Although people have now pointed out to me that it might be the people are imitating the bird. I don't know, but either way, some <laughs> organism is imitating another organism without access to the actual actions, right? Just by observation. And um, so that's the goal here of, of imitation from observation. It's how to perform it, learning um, how to perform a task given state-only demonstrations. So the demonstration will be a sequence of states. You want to learn a policy from states to actions. Um, and again, we're not the first to, to, try, to um, try to address this, this challenge. There has been work um, on, uh, on, um, from other, other labs on trying to do this, but with limitations. First, they've concentrated mostly on the, uh, the perception problem of trying to, to um, from the states, Sequence, try to figure out what actions were taken, and uh, or, you know, try to try to figure out what the states were that, that the agent went through, and then um, uh, and you know, rather than focusing on what actions can we take to try to be as close to the to the demonstrations as possible, and also they mostly have required time aligned demonstrations. So meaning that if you have multiple demonstrations, that you get to the same state at the same time, which is actually very inconvenient for cyclical actions like walking, right, where you can get to the same state multiple times. And you might have demonstrations where the walking happens more quickly or more slowly. You want to be able to, um, to, you know, to, to learn from those kinds of demonstrations as well. So, um, so our two approaches, uh, the model-based one first is, is called behavioral cloning from observation. It, and the difference between conventional Im imitation learning or behavioral cloning is that rather than having a demonstration that looks like this with states and actions, it's got just states. Um, the states, it doesn't know the actions. And it takes a model-based approach, which is learning an inverse dynamics model to try to fill in what those actions were. Try to infer the actions and then use a conventional behavioral cloning method. Um, so that's a, you, know, you can imagine how that would work. The diagram here is you initialize your policy, run it, um, collect a bunch of data to learn what happens when you're in a state and take, a, you know, take an action, what next state you get to. You can then learn this inverse dynamics model of, from state and next state to what action must have happened. And then once you have that, given your state-only demonstrations, you can use that to fill in the missing actions and then update your policy um, using behavioral cloning. And so that's the, that's the sort of you know, the high-level uh, view of the algorithm. And, uh, and this can be applied. Um, you know, we, we've applied it in sort of these uh, Mujoku domains, like this ant that has to, uh, has to run forwards. Um, that's a 111-dimensional state space and eight-dimensional action space. And, um, and we can compare it here to, to existing methods where the dashed line is uh, random behavior in the simulator. The, um, we've normalized the expert demonstrations to have a performance of 1.0. And then we're going to compare against a bunch of different algorithms, um, not just on forward speed. It's a four-dimensional uh, task, including uh, um, magnitude of, the, uh, of the, um, the control actions. So actually, one of these uh, feature, the feature encoding method actually um, feature, or, the feature expectation matching method um, ends up at doing it very poorly on this pass, task. It's known to, to not do well, so it gets negative reward on this. But the other you know, sort of state-of-the-art methods, um, uh, Gale, generative adversarial imitation learning, and, and behavioral cloning, which do have access to the actions, are, have this performance. And then our method, um, or sorry, and behavioral cloning, that's the red, is doing quite well. Um, Behavioral cloning from observation, our method in green, is doing competitively with these, with these even without access to the, to the actions. And so that was sort of the first, um, the first uh, sort of promising result. And then we started asking, well, what happens if we do give some kind of interaction to the, an experience to the method? So um, in this case, the inverse dynamics model is learned using a random policy, taking you know, sort of analogously to what we did in grounded simulation learning. You can imagine. Um, doing this you know, in a more iterative fashion. And so we can update the model with the learned policy and then um, use a parameter alpha to control the trade-off between how many interactions you get and, and, uh, and the performance. So, um, the, uh, so when alpha equals 0, that's the exact method that I already showed you. It's just behavioral cloning from observation from the random policy. And as we increase alpha, we're increasing the number of interactions allowed um, at each iteration. So um, you know, the, the, main, the only difference between the previous method is that we basically close the loop here, that, that we, once we've updated the policy, we then rerun that policy and, and learn the inverse dynamics model again. And just sort of diagrammatically, um, 
all the previous methods basically do all of their, get all of their environment interactions after the demonstration and can be very expensive post a demonstration. The method I already introduced on the top gets a whole bunch of data before the demonstration to build its inverse dynamics model, but then doesn't need any more um, interactions. By adding this alpha parameter, we're now sort of bridging the, you know, sort of um, bridging the gap between these two, or sort of uh, you know, um, compromising between these two. And so now you can see as we, as we increase alpha, what I've shown here is, is the, the red is behavioral cloning, the green is our, um, the result I showed you before. And as we increase alpha, we get closer and closer to the, um, to the behavioral cloning um, results. So that's, the, that's behavioral cloning from observation, the model-based approach. We've also explored a uh, model-free approach called generative adversarial imitation from observation, or GIFO. And, um, and the observation here is th these are some uh, state transitions in the Hopper domain where you basically have a four-dimensional plot here that take two of the state features um, where you have the before and after, um, where, uh, which, so you have before and after of two different variables, um, which gives you four different uh, parameters, three of which are plotted on the axis, and one is shown by color. Um, and the, the only thing you have to take away from here is that the, the demonstration data's di di distribution is very different than the random policy's dis distribution. So again, this motivates the idea that you'd want to, to uh, um, motivates the idea from behavioral cloning where you want to try to you know, re relearn the inverse dynamics model. But this also shows that if we can generate a policy that shows transitions more like this, it'll be closer to the demonstration, right? So we're basically trying to generate a policy that will have um, state transitions that look more like the demonstration state transitions. And so the way we do this, it's motivated by um, one of these general, generative adversarial methods. The demonstrator on the left there gets state, next state transitions. It's learning a discriminator shown in yellow that classifies all of those as positive or as one. And then, on the, um, on the imitator side, we take a state, we're going to learn, this is going to be the generator, learn a policy that outputs an action, which then gets sent into the environment and paired with the same state that was sent before. And now that same discriminator from the demonstration side wants to classify those as being um, from the imitator. Right? So in, this, in the classic generative adversarial method, the policy is trying to learn um, something that will fool the discriminator, and the discriminator is trying to tell the difference between the demonstration and the imitation. And as you run this, this process, you get a policy, a generator, that's, that makes it very increasingly difficult to tell the difference between them, which means it's as close as possible to the, to the demonstration. And so, um, and so that's, the, you know, that's the sort of diagrammatic view of the, of the algorithm. And now, similarly, we can show... Um, uh, compared to random and, and expert, compared to methods that, um, that do use the, uh, the actions. Here, Gale was state of the art, and, and our method, GIFO, is doing, uh, even without access to the actions, doing um, almost as well. Um, I should say, at this point, this was all with data that's generated from proprioception, so we actually have access to the, uh, to the joint angles. Really, imitation from observation is about um, about video, where the states are not fully ob observable. And so, um, and so we're going to take that. We now uh, have taken um, the same approach, and we're going to present some results based on this at, at IJCHI um, next week, um, that uh, basically does that same idea, but now using video frames. Right? So basically, what's showing on here, you've got the, uh, at the top, you have the generator, the policy that's, that's taking now four frames from a um, from the video of, a, uh, of, of an agent that's, that you're trying to control, and it's outputting an action. Um, that's the policy that's, that's being learned. And then the discriminator down here is trying to distinguish the actions or the transitions that are happening um, between the learned policy and the demonstration data. Exactly the same idea as the, as the earlier slide, but now sending it through a, a typical uh, convolutional uh, neural network stack. Um, and, uh, and in this case, so that you know, the demonstration now just is uh, really from pixels. So this is the, the demonstration that's being uh, used in the, in the hopper task. And the learned policy um, that comes out of this is able to, to get very similar state transitions and, and in fact, uh, behave, um, behave quite well. 
And so again, we can, we can plot now. Uh, I still have the random and the, um, the demonstration or expert data. Um, I'm also showing the, the sort of a, a good policy learning algorithm, TRPO, that's also learning straight from video. So that's, in some sense, the best that we would expect to do from learning from visual observations. Um, and, uh, and in this case, um, none of the other competitive, uh, competitor methods even get close, whereas GIFO is doing, um, uh, um, as you know, we get up to about uh, 10 to 15 trajectories, doing as well as TRPO is. And again, just from state-only demonstrations. So uh, this is leading, you know, to, leads to a bunch of, of ongoing work. This is, uh, again, this is the ongoing dissertation of, of Faraz Tarabi, who's here on an internship um, and in this room. So if I've said any, you know, if I've, you should actually, you know, if I've said anything wrong, you'll, uh, you know, you can correct me during the, uh, the questions. Or if you, anyone asks a difficult question, I'll just um, uh, defer to him. But um, we are testing algorithms on more domains. We're trying to adapt this for physical robots, not just in the, in the simulator, and doing um, also, you know, there's a, a connection here trying to do sim to real transfer, learning in, from, in this way in a simulator and seeing if it will, will combine with ideas like grounded simulation learning. Um, with the ultimate objective of, of is, you know, trying to be as good at, uh, at imitation learning as, as, um, as humans are. Where, and this is sort of a favorite video that, you know, that people, that of, of uh, babies who have just obviously had way too much time watching this video. but, um, but somehow have, uh, have been able to, from observation, um, copy it to a pretty uh, impressive degree. But um, anyway, I won't, won't <laughs> show more of that. Um, yes, question. In the problem statement, I thought it was fundamentally impossible because I could learn things like if the left indicator comes on, then turn left, as opposed to. And, and I couldn't quite see how the alpha parameter in DCO alpha, I mean, unless you're somehow injecting randomization or you're continuing to do some exploration in subsequent iterations of the algorithm, I don't see how you can break this confound between did the indicator cause me to turn left or was it something else that caused me to turn left? Yeah, so learning from dem demonstration is, is uh, you know, in its purest form is simply an Im you know, just copying, right? It's not, and, and especially behavioral cloning, there's not much, um, there's, there's not really a way to, to break that. In, Inverse reinforcement learning, what you are learning is trying to, you're, you're starting from, a, or you're inducing a reward function and then learning a policy to maximize that reward function. In those cases, you can actually get better policies than the demonstration. Um, Without access to the expert's actions, I don't see how we can break this confound between, in the state space, if I happen to have a, a post-treatment effect as part of my state, right? Like, so, I, I took some so action. If you have, 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 have the action levels, right? Like you look at circus, cause and confusion, right? Like, right. 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 like right. Even, even with actions. Yeah, yeah, we're not, we're not trying to learn a causal model here, right? Yeah, we're no, just no, trying no, to no. learn a behavior. So, I, I agree. So I, I'm trying to see like what in this allows me to learn the right policy, which actually lets me get good behavior later, right? Because I might learn the wrong policy, which says I'm in a, I'm in a car, and if the left indicator comes on, then I'll turn left. But that's not quite true. Like it won't generalize well. Um, yeah, I see what you're saying. So, so it's uh, th that's um, yeah. The, the I mean, what would cause the what would cause the left indicator to come on if it doesn't get turned on by the person in the first place? Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah. We, let, let's take this discussion offline because I think you know, it, it is it's subtle. It does get into you know issues of causality, and it's I mean, really, what's going on here is just trying to, to get as close to the state transitions that are observed. And um, you know, yes, it's possible to, to do that in a way that would, um, that would end up having the, the wrong effect. But, but you know, same with the bird and the people, right? It's a, you, know, you, can, you can get similar behavior if you're just trying to mimic. Um, yes, please. Yeah. In that learning from just observation is hard for humans as well. That's right. I can watch snowboard jumps for a month and I won't be able to do that. <laughs> but you will if I tell you how, what I'm doing when I do it, then you'll be able to do it. <laughs> no, it's, I, I know, point, but point very, well, point very well taken. In fact, that's uh, um, the subject of some ongoing research with uh, Scott Neekum and Ray Mooney. We just got an NSF grant to exactly um, improve 
learning from human feedback with natural language uh, input as opposed to just, right? So there's, there's different modalities that you can learn from. This is just imitation. You can also learn from positive and negative feedback, a person saying good job or bad job. I have research in my lab on uh, the Tamer algorithm that Brad Knox int introduced that's you know, just purely positive and negative feedback. But yes, now adding, you know, language is a very rich signal, and, and there's lots of different ways in which it could be used. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're embarking down that path right now. Or even people who are actors, right? There are a lot of people going down the line. Like, if you could just say that it is safe to go there, yeah. like, just a physical interaction. Yeah. Be... yeah, exactly. And, and that it does, you're right, it does also have good connections with safety issues, like what are the guardrails you can put on and, and to, to, so that it learns in a sandbox or learns you know, in a process control without making the factory explode or something like that. What are the limitations you can put on these things? So um, yeah, there's lots of, lots of issues here that on, on learning with, um, with safety constraints, learning with improving with language feedback, there's, you know, we're, not, we're not at all at the limits of what can be done in terms of um, learning from human interaction. Oh, good. Um, I know we're uh, we're roughly out of time, so that's basically what I wanted to to say. I, um, you know, uh, this all connects back to to the research question of what what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and their adversaries in real time dynamic domains, especially focusing on reinforcement learning and robotics in this talk. Um, there are other reinforcement learning. If I had more time, I could tell you about some of our work on curriculum learning um, and, uh, and uh, some of Matthew's work on deep reinforcement learning in continuous action spaces, other work on learning de from, from demonstration. But I think you know, in the interest of, of time, I'll skip through that. And also, there's some other work on um, multi-agent systems that we've done in my lab. I'm, I'm especially excited about the problem of ad hoc teamwork right now. We have another paper at IJCHI next week on, on learning in these kinds of settings, which is basically the challenge of how do you get an agent to, to learn to work with teammates that it's never seen before, like a person playing a pickup soccer game or a pickup basketball game, or robots in a disaster rescue scenario, everybody bringing one robot, but them Im immediately figuring out how to work together. And so um, this challenge of creating a good team player we've, uh, is, is now a triple AI challenge problem, and we've made uh, some, some good progress on that, and including in you know, just tying everything back. Uh, including in the robot soccer domain, where we don't do now Steady have um, However, some no competitions where people exist. each, they guarantee that the each bring their own robots um, and uh, and put them on a field, even though they've never worked together. Try to get them to work together as a as a team. And uh, so this is just a video of one of those games, and it, it looks a little less organized it, uh, than when one pr one you know group programmed all the robots. But that's the uh, you know that's the challenge is trying to trying to get them to um, to work together with with unknown teammates, um, and there's a special issue of of uh, AIJ coming up now. There was one of Jamas. There's workshops on this topic, so always happy to talk about that. But let me with that let me let me wrap up and just um, you know the the real theme of this talk was efficient robot skill learning. I told you about gra grounded simulation learning and imitation from observation, um, and uh, you know a bunch of different methods. I'll be here all day, I'll be more than happy. I think I'm meeting with many of you. If people do want to stick around, I'm happy to take more questions now. Um, but I won't be insulted if, uh, if anybody wants to leave. So thanks for your attention. Yeah, yeah, actually, so let me, the browser has been thinking about this. So he's asking about the embodiment mismatch. You want to say something about that? Uh, yeah, we have not exactly tested that, but the thing that we tested was like uh, for um, different, a little bit different point of views, like by changing the uh, pixels and like moving the uh, window around. And uh, it works like, without any uh, extra effort. But we haven't we haven't gotten to the point of being able to say how how robust are we to this yet. So we're we're, we're starting down that path. That's a good question though. Yeah, because you're right. Like the birds and the people, there's an embodiment mismatch in addition to being observation. If it's if it's exactly the same body, it's you know that. So that's just still where we're at right now. Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, I'd say it's with the with the question I was just asked. Basically, if there had been any thought to. Uh, when you have, when you're trying to learn from a demonstration where you don't have the same actions, I mean, it is basically embodiment mismatch. But yeah. I wasn't sure if there was a, um, 
Uh, basically, if there's parts of the policy that you're trying to imitate that you uh, have no hope of uh, being able to imitate, I was wondering if there had been any thought about how to um, perform imitation in this sort of setting. Yeah, I mean, it's, in some sense, we're getting towards that by once we start dealing with the uh, the video, you know, inputs. Um, because now we don't have direct access to the, you know, even to the states, they're partially observable, things, things like that. But yes, as, I mean, in principle, these algorithms will work as long as you have a, um, a mapping between the states of the, of the one body and the states of the other body. You're, you're just going to try to get as close as you can to, you know, the, to that mapping. So, um, in fact, you know, one of the, uh, this is sort of, um, you know, one of the things I skipped over here is, is, um, this was some, some work of Adam, Adam Setupin where he was looking at a sort of learning from um, interaction um, where we were having a person in a bodysuit basically controlling the motion of a now um, and using that to sort of you know, seed some skills. And to do that, we had to make a mapping between you know, the person's joints and the robot's joints, which are not the same. And then once you, you, know, once you do that, then you can try to you know, have the robot figure out, well, I'm, I'm, you know, the person's there. In this case, the idea was that the person was going to learn to get better at controlling the robot rather than the robot getting better at imitating the person. But, um, and then once doing that, the robot would capture that skill. But yes, you have to have that kind of, um, that kind of mapping. Um, and it's, you know, they're not always, you know, they're not always perfect. So. so I ask because the similarity between the low-level state might not be necessarily you want. In the case that, suppose you're watching a human demonstration where the human does some sort of like, I don't know, juke or some sort of low-level move. Yeah. Um, that your, that your robot has no hope of uh, accomplishing. But they, uh, if they, they get close, it might be counterproductive. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so that's if true. So if you're learning, if you're learning noise to try to imitate whatever it is, and right. it would be really unsuccessful and, uh, and really counterproductive for the Right. I mean, an imitation is always fraught with the idea that, you know, usually you're imitating an imperfect policy. You may learn to imitate the imperfections, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's theoretically possible that the extent to which you, um, you know, are incorrect in your imitation actually improves performance. But more often than not, you would expect that, you know, you're actually going to reduce performance. And, uh, you know, and, and the imitations could also focus on exactly the wrong thing. So, yeah, there's no... Um, it's you know it's sort of proceed at your own risk a little bit, but there's you know it's it's the these these methods do uh, the the big appeal the big appeal of them is being able to learn from uh, very few examples, right? I mean you know and, and the, the one of our you know in this kind of paradigm like you can the, I think the clearest example was actually um, Brad Brad Knox in his Tamer work was was uh, um, we used the game of Tetris where um, you know, you can you can learn to play Tetris using reinforcement learning with um, you know thousands of games, but here we were learning from just a person saying good move and bad move. So it's flashing green when it was a good move and red when it was a bad move. And in this case, it would you know even in the first episode, even the first game, it starts to to look much better than random, right? It's not just placing uh, placing randomly anymore. And by the third. Um, you know, by the third game, it starts to look like a really competent te Tetris player, as opposed to after thousands and thousands. And so, you know, the, and then, of course, what you, what you really want to do is use the demonstration to speed up learning, and then use reinforcement learning to actually learn the parts you, you want. And that's been, that was part of Brad's thesis as well. So it's really, you know, you, you, um, I think I wouldn't recommend learning only from demonstration, we're, but we're looking at ways to, to learn from demonstration as effectively as possible. And then, yeah, in the long run, you want to try to, to mix the two to get the, the best of both worlds. Yeah? Uh, the simulated uh, grounded simulator, VCO, and Backforce, the implicit assumption seems to be that although you're not looking for time aligned things, you're still expecting that both in simulation or in the demonstration and the agent, they're acting at roughly the same time scales. Like, uh, I'm wondering if you've thought about situations where Maybe the robot is just operating at 60 hertz when humans are probably operating at like maybe you know, once every two seconds or something like that. And then how does one even begin to think about formulating it in the... So actually in principle, if, if, I mean, if we take time out of it, if we're just looking at the, the, you know, the state transitions, right. Right, we don't necessarily, it, it doesn't really matter what the time scale is. It just says what, what state comes after the next state. So a demonstration in these methods could be at 60 hertz, and 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 the operation could be at you know at, at, a, at a much slower time scale. All it's all we're really optimizing here is what comes after the last thing, 
Now, you could add into it if you wanted to keep them time aligned that they happen at the same rate. But there's actually no pressure in anything I've talked about here to, to work at the same rate. It's just what state comes after it at whatever rate you're acting. Right? So I think in these, in these methods, it's actually, you know, if, if what you're trying to do is deal with uh, things that act at different time alignments, that this is a, actually a feature for what we've talked about. If what you're trying to do is make them work at the same rate, then we'd have to add a different, we'd have to sort of add a different device. Maybe there's a new study that means if, if I'm increasing the frequency at which I'm acting, maybe the transition models can trivially learn something like just re repeat the previous state because honestly the states are badly changed. Like, Know, at, at that high frequency, so the transition model just learns like. To oh, I see. So the, the simulators, the simulators are, or the simulator in the real world operate at the same rate, but the actions exactly. uh, operate at different rates. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then the, the trend that the, you're not going to get the mapping between transitions of the same of the same actions. So right. Then then we would have to um, we'd have to deal with some kind of other uh, other way of to to bring those into alignment. But you again, you could. I mean, the the first. The first approach, cut approach to that would be to just say, you know, I'm going to take the, the action that lasts 30 frames that gets me to the, as close as possible to the action that the, you know, that the demonstrator got to 30 frames later, right? You, you know, sort of take jumps in, in that kind of a space. But, you know, who knows? We haven't, we haven't tried that. So. In fact, there is theoretical proof now that just in state state transition, imitation is a lower bound of the full project imitation. Right, meaning this is this is very, it's, it's not that complicated, but there's a recent paper which shows that, right? So, yeah. yeah. I'm really amazed by the uh, Apple findings in Apple, and uh, when you give it an order and the device not come to find that one, they tell you if you find the Apple one. And I wonder that it's like, and the robot deal is the same order at the time, like I have to find Apple and then you find the Apple. I wonder if there's a research like, can you catch the Apple over there and I give an order? Like, and the robot need to analyze what I'm saying and what I'm pointing at and doing those, like, analyze those things together. And I'm wondering if there was some sort of so, I, so, so you're talking about having, having sort of uh, Sort of body language as a way of grounding what the what the apple was. You know, there might have been a bunch of them, but it's saying, yeah. I, I mean, I I, um, I haven't done in my lab. We haven't done anything that, that combines that. But uh, I, I I believe I've seen. It's maybe somebody else knows of, of a point around that. I believe I've seen seen work that has used gesture as a as a, a part of uh, a way of grounding what a, what a person is, is talking about. We've done research in my lab on gaze on using gaze as an indicator. And in fact. Um, to, you know, uh, when, when a robot's passing a person in the hallway, uh, having the robot indicate with, a, with sort of an, uh, with a, a gaze that it's going to go this direction by you know, looking there and try to influence the direction the person goes, which is a form of gesture. Um, but we haven't, uh, we haven't specifically used any pointing. But I, I do believe there's research in this space, in the, in the human-robot interaction community. So it's just like reaction to what I'm supposed to yeah, language and gesture and images, and you know, it's, a, it's sort of multimodal, uh, multimodal kind of uh, interaction or multimodal learning that, that people have been looking at. Yeah, please. On the on the center rail, seems like you could have, so you chose to adapt the actions, but it seems like you could have chosen to adapt the states, like instead. Uh, was there a reason to choose the action side? Is that the side that you find more mismatch, or was there a practical reason I'm missing? So we were trying to treat the the simulator as a black box. So to, to, to change the state transition is sort of opening up the simulator and changing the actual simulator. By changing the, by putting a wrapper around the actions, the simulator can remain the same. Um, it has its internal transition function. We don't have to know whether it's using, you know, matrix multiplications or, or like, but we just change the input to the simulator. And the, the state transition isn't something that we really have control over at the policy level, right? The policy is selecting what action to take. It's not selecting what state transition to make. That's the simulator's job. The, the, the next state that comes out of the simulator then feeds back into your policy learning, right? So if you, at that point, you sort of adapt and say, well, the simulator said it became this state, I but see. I'm going to change it because I know the real world actually acts this way. And then the policy would presumably incorporate that sort of correction. Yeah. Uh, you'd also then have to change the, the state of the robot in the simulator. Right, it would have to tell you. You'd not only be telling the, you know, so you'd have to sort of teleport the the joint to where it actually is going. So it would look a lot more awkward. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, I mean, I, I guess in principle that, that could be a, you know, a parallel method to explore, but you know, the, the nice thing about changing the actions is it really is just a wrapper to the simulator. We don't have to, we don't have to know anything about it. It's a, the simulator is a black box. We just you know, alter, the, alter the action and then the simulator does its normal job, both changing the physics of the robot and telling our policy what the next state is. Please. Can you talk a bit the topic of collaboration and in, in the, in the of, of teammates you never met before? What are the way why sometimes that works? Because it's the sure understanding of the world mm -hmm. that people have without not sharing planning, let's say. Yeah. How much do you think that is an opportunity and a challenge in this type of research? Yeah, no, I think that's so. In in the uh, you know in this sort of ad hoc teamwork work, that's a, that's sort of the assumption in some sense is that the agents are all domain experts already in the domain individually, but they haven't worked together before. And so there's a notion of of um, one of the typical methods for for doing this is to sort of have sort of some bank of of types of agents of teammates and and try to try to say, oh, um, I have experience with the you know. The type of agent that uh, that you know always shoots the ball from really far and misses, or you know the ones that run a lot and you know and pass a lot or whatever. Yeah. I, I how much is also a matter of language? How much of this a common grounding of because I can have the same knowledge as you do, mm -hmm. but we devise our own language to understanding our own mental models. Yeah. And when we try to work together, it's just completely mismatched. So this is a this is a, you know it's a very broad broad challenge problem that is designed to encompass that, and the, the so there is some work in ad hoc teamwork that does say well, if you First, a lot of it has, has assumed that there is no shared language or no no shared communication. And you know, the, the fact is, I can go to you know, I can go to China and 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 play a pickup soccer game with people I don't have any shared verbal language with, and still you know. But there has been work also on on um, you know, if you do have that language, what should you say and when should you say it? And is there you know both um, to try to um, you know, to try to influence what they'll, that your teammates will do, but also possibly to teach your teammates what you're going to do. And the same like that, you know, the left hand blinker kind of signal is, is something that, um, you know, it might be that every time I'm going to turn left, I'm going to turn on the blinker, you know, uh, five seconds beforehand. And if my teammates are smart enough, they'll be able to, to now predict what I'm going to do in the future and therefore improve their plans, right? So language and communication can play a big role in this. And it's, it's a, there's a, you know, Learning happening at that moment of collaboration. There can be right. So, so I mean, the the whole premise here is that you don't get to change your teammates. So, you know, you can change yourself, but you have to be able to deal with the teammates that don't know how to learn, the teammates that are you know that are really bad, the teammates that are better than you, the teammates that do learn, and you know, so a really good team player can adapt to all of those situations, right? And and so number one, recognize which type of teammate am I interacting with right now. And then given that one, you know, if it's a learning one, yes, let me take actions that will actually help them improve their performance, that make our, make our team shine. If I figure out they're not going to learn no matter what, then that's just a waste of my time, right? So, you know, the, the, um, the premise is, and people, when, you know, when they go into this, say, oh, let me just change the teammates. Once we do that, the whole thing becomes easy. But the, the, my, you know, I always insist in this, that we have to be able to deal with whatever, you know, whatever you're given, which is the case in the real world, right? You become teammates with, with other people. Um, so that's that to me. That's one of the fascinating aspects of this challenge. Please. So going back to the app world, uh, the robot making the app world. So what is how much does the robot know, and then exactly? I think I kind of missed it. Maybe like what is this? The research problem there. Yeah, so the, the, the research problem we zeroed in on in that particular paper was exactly this, just the open, open world reasoning with the hypothetical objects that are, that are indicated by language where you don't know ahead of time whether they actually exist or not. So in this case, the robot knew that fruit was in the, that appeared in the kitchen. It had a knowledge of where were the three surfaces in the kitchen where the apple might appear. Um, there was, a, there was a, uh, a pretty big knowledge base already uh, present, and it had the language capabilities already given. The, the thing we zeroed in on right there was just um, when, you know, uh, the, the open world aspect of when a person says, I want an apple from the kitchen, you don't want to, to th then instantiate an apple and assume that the apple is really there for sure, because that could lead to contradictions in your database down the road. You want to maintain this hypothetical object that's different from the objects that are in your database, and then be able to deal with both the situation where you see one, and then you can unify the hypothetical with the, with the true one, and make the plan, you know, and carry on with your plan, 
or the case where the, the hypothesis was, was false. So it's, it's, it's really, I mean, the, the paper was presented in the ICAPS conference, the, 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 planning, the planning and scheduling conference. So it's really about sort of, you know, symbolic, uh, symbolic representations and, and, um, and, reasoning and reasoning and planning in that kind of a setting. Now, it's part of a bigger system, which is the whole RoboCup at home, um, you know, where we have uh, situations where the robot doesn't know the environment ahead of time, like in the restaurant task, and where there's perceptual problems and um, challenges and all those kinds of things. But we, we focus just on that open world reasoning in that, in that paper. And so just following on from that, was that paper also considering, like, so you have a hypothetical apple, and then maybe the robot goes on, there's two concrete apples. Is that, is that kind of... Um, yeah, so, so in this case, it was going to, uh, it wasn't, right, so this then gets to the sort of the gesture issue of like if, you know, would there be a way to disambiguate between it? In this case, what it's going to do is it's going to ground, it's going to, the first apple it does see, it's going to ground with the hypothetical one. It's not going to keep open the hypothesis that there might be more than one and this is the wrong one. Um, but, you know, that, so, you know that's, uh, that would be the next step of, of um, or, or maybe it's reasoning that, you know, I just have to find one, that's good enough, right? Yeah, but these are the kinds of things that you know. People all there's a lot of research now in AI on just you know what can we do with a neural network end to end, and um, problems like this, like robot soccer, like RoboCup at home, we're just so far from being able to just you know throw a neural network at the you know from perception to action. It requires really bringing together everything that we've done in AI over all the years. It leverages you know, a lot of the research that, that's, and great progress that's happened in vision using end-to-end -end neural networks and convolutional neural networks and things like that. But we're, you know, I think we have to also bring in um, this kind of, of reasoning and symbols and, and the things that, and, and you know, probabilistic modeling and all of these things that are, that are, I think, still really, really important parts of the AI puzzle. And so that's why I like these application domains. It forces us to, to grapple with these, with these issues. That would be good for a, a next paper for the, the NeurIPS community, I would think. Anyways, I think we'll find about 100 years. With that, uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Peter. Thanks.